Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carmen Blair, the Deputy Director of the San Mateo County Historical Association, and I would like to welcome you to today's Courthouse Docket. The Courthouse Docket is a monthly series of lectures and performances sponsored by Cypress Lawn Heritage Foundation. Now, usually the programs are held in the museum's historic courtroom A. However, we moved the program online due to COVID-19. One note on logistics. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box, not the chat. We will take questions at the end of the program. Each month during the courthouse docket, we explore different aspects of local history. Recognizing the 50th anniversary of the incorporation of Foster City, today's presentation focuses on the construction of the city and the unique features that make up its character. Our presenter today is Richard Hopper, who served as the Foster City's Public Works Director from 1975 until 1980. He received his BS degree in civil engineering from the University of Illinois. Following a stint in the US Navy, he moved to California, where he worked for the city of San Mateo before being hired by Foster City. He left public service in 1980 and started his own civil engineering firm, RKH Civil and Transportation Engineering, headquartered in Foster City. He is also a Foster City resident. Richard, thank you for joining us today to talk about the development of Foster City. You're welcome. Welcome everyone. Um, I wanted to uh, tell you briefly about how the Fosters came about uh, the acquisition of Brewers Island. Here's a photograph taken in 1946 of Brewers Island and it encompasses pretty much all of this area here. This is called Seal Slough originally. It's now Marina Lagoon in San Mateo. So, in 1958, the Foster organization came to the Bay Area looking for potential development sites. And they met with Richard Grant, who at that time was a real estate agent and developer in San Mateo. And his office was in Los Prados in San Mateo. And his office overlooked Marina Lagoon onto Brewers Island. And uh, he the Fosters were very impressed with that because here's a large tract of land that's reasonably flat and levees around it and had a great potential. Um, just as a background, in 1900, a man by the name of Frank Brewer levied off this island area to uh, let the land dry out and he uh, um, created a, a little dairy cattle business and he grew hay on there for the cattle. And in 1906, of course, we had the big earthquake, but the levees around Brewer's Island held without any problem. So that was a good beginning uh, of, for the area. So the Fosters were very interested in purchasing this Brewer's Island. It was owned by the Schillings who lived in Woodside and Schillings of the Schilling spice business, but they weren't interested in selling. But after about two years negotiation, they agreed to sell um, Brewer Island uh, to the Fosters for a little under $12 million. The the whole area is about 3,000 acres and the, and the upper northwest area was a tract of land owned by uh, Thomas Thurkelson. He also had a little dairy farm there. So his 300 acres were not part of the original sale. But um, an aside story goes that after the Fosters bought their part of Brewer's Island, there was a dispute over a bill for milk between Thurkelson and the Fosters, and the bill was only $11. But 
But because of that, Thurkelson refused to sell his property to the Fosters. Those 300 acres became Mariner's Island in San Mateo. So now the plan was to develop Foster City. And here's an overlay of the future development based on the original 1946 photograph. You can see here, this was Third Avenue. This is Foster City Boulevard. This is Shell Boulevard. And this is Mariners Island Boulevard going into Edgewater Boulevard. So those are major streets. And this is uh, the uh, other main, this is Hillsdale Boulevard. So you can see how the development occurred over time. This blue line here was the beginnings of Highway 101. And over here was El Camino. So now in 1960, the Fosters purchased the island and they needed a vehicle to develop it. So they uh, got the state senator, Richard Dolwig, and assemblyman Carl Britschke to sponsor legislation to create the Estero Municipal Improvement District. And I believe there's only two such districts in the state of California. Um, that Estero District has all the powers of a city except for planning and building. Those two powers were held by the County of San Mateo. But that was the vehicle by which they could sell bonds based on the value of the property um, in order to then uh, develop the island. So the first thing they did was to create a master plan. And the Fosters hired a number of major uh, engineering and architectural, e economic firms, financing, all the aspects of creating a city. And this was the master plan that they originally came up with. And as you can see, it's pretty much, oh, sorry, close to the way it is today. Um, the uh, concept of the central lagoon, as you can see here, goes through Foster City, um, was a scheme created by Wilsey Ham that reduced the amount of fill needed to provide proper drainage um, of, the, of the site. The county engineer at the time wanted the fill to be eight to 12 feet thick over on top of the bay mud, which would have caused huge settlement problems throughout the property. Um, and so the Fosters went to this county board of supervisors with plan A of the county for 45 million yards and plan B with only 18 million yards to fill the island. So the county board of supervisors approved the plan B to create the uh, plan as we see it. Now, the reason that the lagoon has the shape it has the engineers determined that the maximum distance away from the lagoon that you could properly drain the land was about 1,100 feet. So 1,100 feet uh, is how that shape was created. As you can see, I'm sorry, it's going backwards here. Um, excuse me. The, um, so the, the plan was to create the, the fill in the island uh, for about 18 million yards. So the question came about as to where we were gonna get the fill. But uh, first I wanted to point out, these are photographs of the model of Foster City. They're actually, I'm sorry. Um, there were two models built. Uh, unfortunately, neither model has survived. Um, and so we don't have 
the benefit of seeing that anywhere now. But you can see in this master plan, there were a number of high rise buildings throughout the city. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> keeps uh, jumping on me. Um, so the, uh, there's another picture of the master plan. The, the plan, uh, the model was in the Foster building for many, many years. You can see the Highway 92 coming through Foster City and the industrial area to the north and all the residential to the south. Here again, this is town center. We have a high rise building. Actually, the uh, building in, Foster, in, in our town center, Metro Center, is the tallest building between San Francisco and Los Angeles, just so you would know that. So the question came, where are we going to get the 18 million cubic yards? Uh, one scheme was to get the fill from San Bruno Mountain. And that proved to be very expensive. Uh, the Fosters, along with Dames and Moore, uh, excavated and you know investigated uh, hydraulic sand fill, and they determined there was a source of sand near the San Francisco airport called San Bruno Shoal, and that San Bruno Shoal held about 28 million cubic yards of sand. The problem was it was overburdened by 30 million cubic yards of bay mud. So the Fosters um, went to a competitive bidding to see who could come up with a good scheme to uh, extract that sand and were not successful. So Fosters on their own put together a plan and then they hired associated dredging of Sausalito to manage the operation. Um, so Associated came up with this scheme of a dual ladder dredge, one removing the bay mud and one removing the sand. Now this is a picture of the barge that was converted into the dredge. It was a 250 foot long Navy barge that Associated rebuilt as a dredge and alongside it, Sorry. You can see the, um, the barge that the sand was dumped into. Now, the barges came from the, San Fran or the Southern Pacific Railroad in Utah. And these barges were used to fill a railroad uh, across the, the Great Salt Lake. So they were no longer needed there. So the Fosters bought these barges, had them cut apart, shipped by rail to Oakland where they re were reassembled. These were the largest bottom dump barges in the world and they were electrically operated. So here's a picture of the dredge with the suction the ladder dredge here and in the front of it. Um, the sand would be dumped into the barge and it would take about two and a half hours to fill the barge. And um, once the barges were filled, then uh, we had a the tugboat push the barges down to Brewer's Island. And Then uh, at Brewer's Island, there's a secondary dredge that uh, created a basin um, outboard of the levee close to where the uh, Beach Park Plaza shopping center is today. So the plan was that the barge would come down here and they would dump the sand into this basin. It only take less than a minute to empty the barges, but uh, anyway, the the barge, the sand was dumped in here, and then the dredge picked up the sand and pumped it onto the land. And here's a picture of the pipes that were coming from the uh, dredge onto the land, 
And um, this operation went at the rate of about 12 to 16,000 cubic yards every 24 hours. And this operation went seven days a week, 24 hours a day for six years. The, um, there's another picture of the uh, sand coming out onto the land. Then they had to uh, create the lagoon and they used dragline cranes to extract the bay mud. You can see here in the lower area, this is all bay mud here. They used some of that bay mud um, to fill in some of the, the low level, low lying areas of Brewers Island that were then filled over on top with the uh, sand. So the 200 acre lagoon um, is the main waterway we have here now in Foster City. Now here's an aerial photo that was taken in 1964. You can see here's where the dredge was. You can see, oh, sorry. You can see here where this, this is neighborhood one, the original development area. This is neighborhood two, and this is neighborhood three. So the original initial development, uh, you can see the beginnings of the homes here. Uh, this is Shooting Star Isle. Uh, and this is Hillsdale Boulevard going into San Mateo. That was really the only way in and out at that point. Uh, you can see over here, Foster City. <laughs> uh, Jack Foster wanted everybody to know where Foster City was. So we had these large letters created on the ground so that airplanes flying over could see it. Here's a photo of the fill operation, and this is neighborhood two. You can see the barge here, and the, and then the pipelines that came out with the uh, hydraulic sand and filling the neighborhood. This is the beginning of, a, of one of the parks, and there's one of the seven original islands. That's um, Shearwater Isle today. Here's another picture. There's the dredge and the filling of neighborhood two and three and the beginning of the seven original islands. And you can see some roadways, construction areas. And here's the very first house built on um, Shooting Star Isle and that's called the Captain's House. And that's where Jack Foster, Jack Foster lived in Monterey and he moved here after the construction began. So this was his home and it was called the captain's house. And then you can see the beginnings of construction in neighborhood one. And then you see the Foster City letters on the ground there. And then the background would eventually become uh, Redwood Shores. In the uh, creation of these seven original islands, uh, and real estate agents know this today, there's narrow water and wide water. So in the construction of these islands, they built concrete T-walls on these areas that were the narrow water, which was between the island and the mainland portion. Uh, I can show you in the previous picture. You can see this is called narrow water and this is called wide water. And it, all the islands had the narrow water areas, but they were uh, accessible by only one point from the mainland area onto the island. And all those concrete T-walls exist today. Uh, here's one of the roadway culverts we're crossing from the mainland onto one of the islands. Here's a picture of the uh, water entry 
uh, from Belmont Slough, the, the lagoon, uh, as it operates today, receives salt water from, uh, from uh, Belmont Slough through uh, 42 inch pipes that empty into the lagoon. And you can see these are the controlling mechanisms for opening and closing the pipe gates. And here's the water entering the lagoon from Belmont Slough. The, um, at the northern end of the lagoon is the drainage pump station. And um, the pump station contains two large, it has capacity for four pumps. But right now there's only two in there. Um, but uh, the lagoon, uh, the, the way it was designed, there were um, discharge gates, seven foot by seven foot gates. There were eight of those. And then the two pumps. So they could discharge the lagoon water back into the bay, either through the gravity gates or by pumping if the tide was up. So we had the capacity to discharge no matter what the tidal conditions were. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but this is the backside of the pump station. The front side of the pump station is all glass. And the reason for that is Jack Foster would bring visiting dignitaries to Foster City to show off uh, the island. And he would bring them out here to Third Avenue and show them the pump station, how we're going to discharge the water from the lagoon into the bay. He was very proud of that. Um, So then, and you can see in the background here, those were the clarifying tanks for the sewage treatment uh, facility. Um, and this was the control room for the pump station and also for the sewage treatment plant. Because Third Avenue at that time was the state highway, Highway 92, the state would not allow uh, the Estero District to construct the discharge channel uh, across Third Avenue. So the only way they could discharge the lagoon water was by these uh, pipes coming from the two pump, uh, pumps in the station. Then um, the first water tank was constructed in 1966. Uh, this tank holds 4 million gallons and the Estero District purchased water from the San Francisco Water Department. Uh, and the connection point was by the intersection of Alameda de las Pulgas and Crystal Springs Road in San Mateo. And so from that point through the city of San Mateo, they constructed a 24 inch welded steel pipe to serve Foster City. Um, and here's the completed tank and uh, the control building. There are presently now, this was the first one, there are now four such four million gallon um, water tanks serving Foster City. And these are used uh, continuously. The water flows through them out into the system to make sure the water main, main, maintains uh, in a fresh state of mind. And so that was the water capacity. Here's a picture of the construction of the sewage treatment facility. It was only a primary treatment facility uh, in, in terms of settling the solids out and trucking that off to a disposal area and then pumping the fluid out into the deep water channel of the bay. Here's a picture of one of the clarifiers. This has since been, the treatment facility in Foster City has been removed and it's been re consolidated with the treatment facilities in San Mateo. So Foster City owns a share of that facility. Here's a picture of the discharge pipe, welded steel pipe, um, cement coated. Um, 
and so they created this discharge pipe and it was about um, half a mile long and they plugged it off at both ends sorry and then they by tugboat they pulled the pipeline out into the bay in a pre uh, determined trench and they set up the pipe in the trench and backfilled it over so this was the pipe going through the levee and then you can see here was a plated off area with a gate valve and then that from that point back to the treatment facility there was another pipeline added and you can see there you can see the the dredge actually was pulling the pipeline out to the deep water and that discharge pipe is still used by the San Mateo Foster City treatment facility there's another picture of the filling in the back the filling in the levee after the pipeline here's a picture um, of utility construction along the little channel that goes from basically the rainbow bridge on hillsdale boulevard out to the treatment facility and the pumps the drainage pump station these are sewer and water lines and um sorry oh i and these were constructed in around 1964 so now here's a picture of the um, new construction uh, in neighborhood one. And you can see here's the T walls of the narrow water areas and the construction of the homes. This was in 1964. And here's another picture and here's the captain's house. The designer of this captain's house was also the designer of the current Foster City Recreation Building. And you can see in 19, oh dear, 1964 sailboats were the thing. Everybody had a sailboat. Um, now you can see here in this photograph, aerial photograph of Neighborhood One, you can see kind of a patchwork of construction. And the reason for that was that Dames and Moore, the soils engineers, determined certain areas needed to have um, areas settle more than others before you actually put a building on top of it. So they actually put, sometimes they would put an overburden on some of the land to increase the settlement to where it would be a reasonable um, degree of settlement that you could then Put a building on top of it so that created quite a variety of different models of homes throughout the area they weren't all by one particular builder here's another picture of neighborhood one looking across the uh, islands into neighborhood two and you can see it's still being filled Oops, sorry um, and then there's a construction road across there also, which was later removed. But now you can see the construction of homes here in neighborhood one. The uh, first homes in neighborhood one sold for $21,950 for a three bedroom model and upwards to 30,000 for a larger building. That was in 1964. Here's another picture of neighborhood one and you can see here is one of the little neighborhood parks that would connect the different areas of the neighborhood and the kind of the patchwork of construction. Here you see this is not built and here's other areas where it was still uh, being filled and the construction on the islands beginning of that. Here's another picture of uh, the Foster City letters. Those letters exist today outboard of the levee 
close to uh, the, uh, where is it? Uh, close to Swordfish, Beach Park and Swordfish. Outboard of that, those letters still exist, although I guess the, a lot of the overgrowth may have blocked the visibility of them, but they're still there. Um, so here's again, here's the model homes for neighborhood one. As I said, the first one sold for 21,900. Here's a picture of one of the little strip parks that connect the neighborhoods. Um, and this is a picture of uh, Erkenbrack Park, the first major park uh, in neighborhood one. Another picture of it, and you can see the beginnings of construction of homes in neighborhood two across the lagoon. This is a picture of Foster City's first school built in 1965 and it was all temporary construction. And it was temporary for 20 years. And then uh, they built the Foster City School at uh, the corner of Beach Park and Edgewater Boulevard and in neighborhood nine. So the school was torn down, but because of the population growth and the need for more schools, this site was rebuilt into, was now Brewer Island School. So in the uh, beginning, we had lots of jackrabbits and we had lots of ducks and we had lots of kids. And this is a picture of Kildare Park near Audubon School. Here's a photograph of Foster City around 1966. And you can see now neighborhood one is being built out and here's neighborhood two and the beginnings of neighborhood three and there you can see the dredge. Uh, here is the layout of neighborhood four, five, and six. And then you can see the filling of neighborhood seven and 8A. And this is neighborhood eight and nine. And in the background, this is Los Prados. And this is all San Mateo here. And there's the old racetrack. And then you can see here the beginnings of the construction of the 92 freeway. So, but up until that time, 92 was a two lane highway on Third Avenue. Um, and so the um, shape of the lagoon, as you can see here, is pretty much the way it exists today. Here's a photo of the Portacol Shopping Center, which is, was the first shopping center built. Uh, in neighborhood two. And um, in that shopping center was a restaurant called the Lobster Trap. And supposedly it had the best lobster anywhere in the Bay Area. The shopping center here is no longer in existence. It was torn down uh, a number of years ago and a large residential development was put in its place. This is the Trade Winds Apartments, 1966. The Franciscan Apartments in 1966. They're all still in existence. And here's a picture of the Foster Building, which is no longer in existence. Um, that has been replaced by a large uh, multi-story uh, commercial office building. So, in the beginning, the city had a number of beautiful, graceful bridges. And the first bridges built were the twin bridges on Hillsdale Boulevard from, this is, Mer this is Norfolk and this is Hillsdale Boulevard going across Marina Lagoon. Um, and there was two lanes in each direction. In 1980, uh, we then uh, hired uh, 
the Nolte firm to design the connection between the two bridges in order to create three lanes in each direction. So now the twin bridges are no longer twins, but there's a beautiful bridge. Now here's a picture of the bridge on Foster City Boulevard over our waterway. And identical bridge was built on Shell Boulevard. So we have two identical bridges across the lagoon. And this is the Rainbow Bridge on Hillsdale Boulevard. And this is the waterway that goes from the main lagoon out to the drainage pump station. And you can see that in the background over there. That's the drainage pump station as where the sewage treatment clarifiers were. This bridge is still in existence and it's still called Rainbow Bridge. So some of the unique features of Foster City, uh, Foster's uh, wanted to have everything unique and different. So they came up with, created a design for a fire hydrant and they wanted a fire hydrant that somebody could sit on. So this is the design that came, came about and it won a national award for design. The residential streetlights were also unique. They had this row of fins around the, the luminaire and it was a very unique uh, street light. The arterial street lights um, had a shield around the luminaires and unfortunately because of that weight on the luminaires and the arms we had to take those shields off um, because of their weight. The poles in Foster City are painted with a particular blue called Foster City Blueprint Blue. Unfortunately though, the sun fades this color quite rapidly. So once you paint it uh, blue, probably six months later it'll be oxidized. But that's, that's the color that was originally designed for Foster City. Here's another picture of Foster City Boulevard uh, with the street lights and the power lines on the left side. This was taken around 1970, I believe. Here's a picture of the uh, public safety building, original public safety building. Uh, as I said, Foster City had all the characteristics of a municipality except for planning and building. They had their own fire department, their own police department, public works, parks and recreation, everything except planning and building. Here's a picture of the fire truck. And here's a picture taken around 1972, um, I'm sorry, 1970. You can see pretty much neighbors two, three, and beginning of neighborhood four. This is five and six, and it's still being filled, but um, because of a lawsuit filed um, against the district, by a man by the name of Cooper, the fill operations were stopped for an inordinate length of time. And so the, actually the hydraulic fill operations ceased in 1967. Uh, but then um, the district and the city reapplied to um, have a new fill permit issued. Um, and in 1976, we had a fill operation that um, finished off neighborhood seven, neighborhood 8A and town center. The commercial areas to the north of 92 were filled in by, I'm sorry, um, the developers themselves. The Stero did not do the filling, but we did fill the town center area and 
down here in neighborhood seven and eight A. So that fill operation in 1977 took uh, about a year and we brought in 2,100,000 tons of dry land fill at a cost of $5.6 million and it required 92,000 truck trips. What was unique about that fill operation is we had a way in motion scale because we only paid by the weight of the vehicle of, of the net weight of the vehicle but it was a way in motion where the trucks didn't have to stop to be weighed they could be in motion as they were weighed which speeded up the operation considerably here's a infrared photo of foster city taken around 1972 and still you can see here the uh, spider webs of the fill operation that were left uh, after the fill operation, the it's hydraulic sand operation was ceased. And you can see here the islands. This is not exactly the way it is today. This is Plum Island, and this is the island on where I live. And these are the islands, Island I and Island J, which I'll show you in a few minutes but you can see here this area was the area that Thurkelson owned that he then uh, developed as part of San Mateo in called Mariner's Island the um, unique thing about uh, Foster City you get a entirely different perspective of the homes and buildings around the city from the water side versus driving around on the streets. Here's examples of some of the homes built on the lagoon. And uh, this is Harborside townhome development in 1977. And it's another picture of the harbor side development. The islands, a very unique condominium development. Um, it won um, award of excellence from the architectural record and an award of merit from the American Institute of Architects. Uh, some people call it Lego land, but uh, it's a really a unique, beautiful development that you can see across the water as you drive in from Hillsdale Boulevard. Here's another picture of it. Whalers Island, Whalers Cove was another development built in 1977. It won a Sunset Magazine Western Home Award. Very unique uh, buildings. Uh, Again, from the water side, totally different perspective of uh, what you see um, from driving on the streets. And here's a picture of Foster City as it exists today. It's pretty much fully developed. Uh, all of the residential areas are complete. Uh, here's the islands. Um, and over here is part of Mariner's Island. And so that is how Foster City got built. And I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Richard. I'm going to go back and pick up some of the questions that came in as, um, as you were speaking. A couple of questions on the captain's house clarification. Was it on Shooting Star or Flying Cloud? And does it still exist today? It does exist today. Um, I believe it's Shooting Star Isle. I'm not, I'm not certain, but, okay. it's, but it's right there. Okay. At the Thank very you. northern end of that island. That was the first island that was developed. Um, about the pump house, you say there's only two pumps in it right now. Could additional pumps be added to it? 
Yeah, there's capacity for four pumps, but they, but the city uh, replaced the original diesel engine pumps with larger capacity, and they determined that additional capacity was was uh, enough that would would not warrant the addition of a third or fourth pump. But the capacity is still there. Okay. And the, and the 84 inch slide gates. Uh, interesting story. Those slide gates sat unused against a blank wall for about 10, 12 years. And when I was public works director, we were able to then, because Highway 92 was moved off of Third Avenue, we could build our outfall structure uh, out to the bay. So those slide gates were, were then tested and they all worked exactly except one which had a little broken wire. We fixed the broken wire. Now all the gates work, which was amazing for them to sit there in salt water for 12 years and not being used. So it's a compliment to the designers. Okay. What kind of overburden was implemented on soils to get it to settle? Well, the sand fill is about four to five feet. And then on top of that, they put topsoil of about maybe six inches, you know, for it to grow uh, grass and things. But it's uh, four to five feet of sand fill. Okay. Uh, do you know how deep the lagoon is on average behind the houses that are on the islands? The lagoon is, is okay. The top of the lagoon wall, originally the Foster City Datum had that as elevation 100. And the reason they picked 100 because they didn't want minus numbers. So the top of the lagoon wall is approximately elevation 100. The top of the lagoon itself in the summertime is elevation 99. And it's, and it's three feet deep close to the walls and it's six feet deep in the middle everywhere. It doesn't get any deeper. It's six feet deep in the summertime. In the wintertime, they lower the lagoon to accommodate more rainfall runoff. So um, then it's maybe only five feet deep or five and a half feet deep, but it's, that's uniform throughout the lagoon. Was there ever a maximum build out in terms of population that Foster City was designed and planned for? It's, it's I, I believe, they estimated originally that they would have a population of around 35,000. And I think we're pretty close to that now. Uh, do you know some of the streets in neighborhood number one that would be familiar to people today? Um, well, let me see if I can go back and hold on here a second. This is uh, neighborhood one. Um, I believe this is Comet here. Um, let me check my notes. Pilgrim Drive. Uh, let's see, Harvester. Oh, this, no, I'm sorry, this is Harvester. This is Comet right here. Okay. Harvester. And then uh, Challenge Court, where is Challenge Court? I believe that's Challenge Court right there. So those are some of the streets. Constitution, I believe is this one over here. Niantic, and this was the area of what would be the original Foster City School. Uh, if you know, why did the Foster family do land leases on many or maybe all of the original waterfront homes? I, I don't have an answer to that. Fine. Uh, do you know, did the plan for Foster City include the area of Bridgepoint when first designed? I'm, uh, the person asking is on the Edgewood, Edgewater Isle complex on the lagoon. Uh, Bridgepoint is part of Mariner's Island. 
And, and like I said, uh, Mr. Thurkelson didn't want to sell his land to the Fosters because of a conflict in eleven dollar milk bill. Um, let's see if I can follow this question. Uh, foundation started with grade beams, later converted to slab on grade. How are they performing? Um, I think overall the design of the slabs uh, in Foster City was, uh, I believe the structural engineer was Rutherford and Chicane, and they came up with some pretty unique designs. Um, I know for couple of instances where foundations were poor, slab foundations were poured in the wrong place. They were literally picked up and moved in one piece to the correct location and set back down without any structural effect. And there's very, very little differential settlement in Foster City. Uh, there are many areas in San Mateo uh, I think 19th Avenue Park is one example. It has a tremendous differential settlement problems. And so the Fosters wanted to make sure that the land on which the homes were gonna be built was solid, that uh, was not gonna be causing kind of differential movement of the slab or the foundation after it was built. So I think by and large, the problems of differential settlement in Foster City are really minimal. Um, I have a couple of questions coming in on earthquakes. Um, what are the characteristics of the soil or planning to help get through an earthquake? And um, also questions about evacuations in case of natural disasters. Okay, in terms of, of earthquake, um, Foster City literally sits on bay mud and that goes down for some places hundreds of feet. Um, what's unique is though there is bedrock, surface bedrock at the base of the San Mateo Bridge. Uh, but everywhere else uh, Foster City's sitting on bay mud. The thing about bay mud is the more you shake it the stronger it gets. Um, in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, Foster City had virtually no damage at all, uh, much to the chagrin of the U.S. Geological Survey. They said, well, Foster City is going to sink into the, into the bay because of liquefaction. Liquefaction occurs in unconfined sand, uh, and if you shake it, the water tends to separate the particles and it becomes a liquid. And that's why uh, people fall into, into that. And uh, quicksand, it's actually very slow moving, but it's called quicksand. So they said, because of that, Foster City is going to sink. Well, in the investigation of the underlying bay mud, the uh, soils engineers found these lenses of sand but they were confined completely by the surrounding bay mud. So even if you shook that sand, it, wouldn't, it could not become expanded because of the confines of the bay mud. So all in all, Foster City sits on very stable ground in terms of earthquake resistance. Um, unlike some areas like around San Francisco that were filled in not by engineered fill, but just by filling it in with old boats and stuff like that. And they have settlement problems there and in an earthquake, it could have serious damage as, as what occurred in the Lonely Peter earthquake uh, in the North Beach area. So we had an instance where uh, Glendale Federal Savings refused to loan uh, home loans in Foster City because of the problems of earthquake. So we invited Glendale Federal Savings to come up and take a tour and I gave them a presentation of how it was built and everything. Next thing you know, not only did they start loaning, making home loans, they built, built an office in Foster City. So it's all a matter of education. Um, a question about access 
our ways to um, to uh, get out of the city in case of disaster evacuation routes? Is there sufficient evacuation routes in case of disaster? I, I assume there are. You would have to contact the police, fire departments. I'm sure they have plans for that. I, I'm not uh, familiar with that. Um, as we hit the 50 year milestone from incorporation, what are some of the things we need to consider, take into consideration in our planning and building efforts? Well, I think one of the major things that the city is doing now is, is um, increasing the perimeter boundary of the city to accommodate sea level rise in the future uh, to protect the city as a whole and to not have to have um, flood insurance. So that's a major effort on the part of the city. It's, it's changing some of the characteristics of the neighborhoods, but uh, it is something that has to be done if we're going to protect Foster City from the future um, environmental effects. And so um, that's, uh, that's going to be uh, probably the major thing. But the state is putting tremendous pressure on cities to increase their residential mix, adding more residential units. And a lot of cities are protesting and Foster City, I think, not formally, but has made some comments in protest of this requirement. The only way that Foster City can really grow in the future is up. We can't grow out, so we have to grow up. So it may change some of the residential characteristics if we put high rise residential buildings in Foster City. That's something that city will have to look at down the road to change and that, that would change the character of the city and of the, each of the neighborhoods. And personally, I would be opposed to that. Uh, speaking of the neighborhoods, do you know how the streets got their names? Yes. Um, in neighborhood one, the streets are named after famous sailing ships. In neighborhood two, they're named after birds, sea, you know, seabirds. Uh, in neighborhood three, they're named after fish. Neighborhood four is named after parts of sailing ships, spinnaker, yawl, catch, and so on. Neighborhood five is named after famous explorers. Neighborhood six is named after uh, like Admiral Halsey, uh, Dewey, famous admirals. Uh, neighborhood seven uh, are named after islands. Uh, neighborhood eight, I'm not sure about it. Neighborhood nine is named after constellations. So sailors used constellations for navigation. Uh, looking back further in the history, um, do you know where the original Brewer Dairy Farm stood in relation to what exists today? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Um, I know that Frank Brewer, when he diked off the island and allowed it to dry out, then that bay mud then became usable as soil. Uh, so he grew hay for his uh, dairy cattle. I don't know where uh, his barn was. I know Thurkelson had a barn also on his property who also raised dairy cattle. Uh, do the waterfront homeowners own the land to the middle of the lagoon? No, no. The lagoon primarily is owned by the, by the Estero Municipal Improvement District. Uh, do you have any idea how high the high rise buildings in the original plan mass or, or in the original master plan were? How many stories? Well, let's see. Uh, 
you can see here, there are probably six stories, six or eight stories. You know, like I was saying, you know, to, to grow Foster City in the future, this kind of development may have to occur. But I don't think none of them were as tall as, as the one we have now in, in Metro Center. And that's 24 stories. Okay. Richard, thank you so much for sharing with us today. I've had several questions come in about the recording of this presentation. In the next day or so, a copy of this presentation will be available on the San Mateo County Historical Association's courthouse docket page. It will be toward the bottom of the page and it will say previously on the courthouse docket. That website is historysmc.org. In terms of future um, historical association events, I do want to let you know uh, that on August 10th, uh, the Historical Association will be opening a photographic exhibit, Foster City Through the Years, in our museum rotunda. So that photographic exhibit will be up again starting on August 10th. I would also like to invite everyone to join us for our Victorian Days walking tours that are continuing throughout San Mateo County in August. Uh, reservations are required for the in-person tours. Our Victorian Day celebration will be online at historysmc.org on August 21st with a new Victorian fashion show and reenactment. The courthouse docket will be returning on September 11th as Barbara Wilcox discusses the first 100 years of the College of San Mateo. Uh, we are being brave and currently planning that to be in person at the History Museum with a recording to be available for our online viewers after the event. Again, thank you all for joining us and a special thanks to Richard for his presentation. Very welcome. Thank you.